Hello, and welcome to the 52nd Radical Poetry Reading. I'm Malva Kajali, Special Projects Associate here at The Rail, and today I have the pleasure and privilege of welcoming artist, poet, and curator Joanne McFarland uh, to the Zoom stage, who has lovingly curated a fantastic lineup of poets and readers for us today, featuring E.J. Antonio, Meg Carney, and Karen Lalonde Alenier. Uh, a few quick notes before we get started. Our chat is a place for community, so please feel free to introduce yourself and shout out where you're tuning in from in the chat. That's always fun. Uh, the Rail team will be here helping out with tech. If you have any questions and closed captions are available by pressing the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, we've started out all of our events here with two important acknowledgments. The first is that here in New York, we're on the Napahoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lani Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. And it's worth remembering that the heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and ongoing solidarity for all those who struggle for freedom in recognition that when it comes to liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation, that thought coming from the luminescent Angela Davis. Um, and in that spirit, I encourage you all to check out the chat where I'll drop momentarily a living document of resources and actions we've been putting together behind the scenes at The Rail. Um, but now it's my honor to welcome our wonderful curator of this lunchtime, artist, poet, actual curator, and friend, Joanne McFarland is the artistic director of Art Poeticus Project Space in Gowanus, Brooklyn, which focuses on work that is both literary and highly visual. McFarland has exhibited widely, both nationally and internationally, for more than 30 years. Her artwork is in the permanent collections of the Library of Congress, the Columbus Museum of Art, the Department of State, and Dynegy, Inc., among many others. She's the author of 18 poetry books and libretti, including a recent series of innovative digital book works. Uh, and in her work, McFarland treats violence and creativity as diametrically opposed. Each act of making thwarts violence's aims to destroy, uh, echoing in many ways uh, the sentiment that I think is at the heart of so many of the rails um, programs and ethos that artists need to create at the same capacity that society has to destroy. Uh, she joined us most recently for our conversation a few weeks ago with our friends at AIR Gallery, for which she was both interlocutor in the conversation and poet to close us out. She read some works from her ongoing chapbook uh, on Pullman, Chicago, a neighborhood and community uh, which serendipitously I, I come from. Um, and uh, you know, she read some works which made uh, the MC of that event cry on air. Uh, so the space is already, already charged with that. Uh, without further ado, uh, Joanne, take it away. Alvika, thank you so much. It's really, really such a pleasure to be here. And thank you to the Brooklyn Rail for allowing us to have this wonderful reading. I think this is a time when we certainly need poetry. So I want to welcome the three readers who I invited, Karen, EJ, and Meg. I'm delighted that they're here and thank you for everyone who is listening in. Um, in in addition to the obvious musicality that they bring to their work, I am so, so grateful for the generosity of spirit that infuses what they do and for their vulnerability. And I think that those are two qualities that we really need now and they're hard to come by. So I think that this will be just an outstanding blend of voices and thank you to the Brooklyn Rail and to all of the staff who are helping for bringing this to life. Thank you so much. Of course, it's such a blessing to have you with us. Um, so I think without further ado, we'll get, we'll get right uh, to our first luminescent reader. Poet E.J. Antonio is the author of two chapbooks, Every Child Knows, which came out with Premier Poets chapbook series in 2007 and Solstice, which came out with Red Glass Books 2013. She's received fellowships from the New York Foundation for the Arts, the Hurston Wright Foundation, and Kaveh Khanum, uh, who I believe will be joining us in about a month to tell us all their secrets. 
Her work has appeared in the Encyclopedia Project, African Voices, Literary Magazine, Black Renaissance Noir, The Mom, Egg, and Killen's Review of Arts and Letters. She's also appeared as a featured reader and performer at venues such as Why Not Jazz Room, Arts Westchester, the Hobart Festival of Women Writers, and the Langston Hughes House, not too far from uh, where I live in New York. Uh, EJ is also a founding member of the Jazz and Poetry Choir Collective, and she's a founding board member of the arts nonprofit One Breath Rising. Uh, everyone give it up for EJ Antonio. EJ, take it away. Thank you, everyone, for coming this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to be reading four poems. Uh, the, the first one I'm going to read is called Coming Home Before Dawn. For the young woman sitting in the car under siege, even the moon turns vigilante. In the darkest morning hours, it illuminates uniforms wielding powers disrespect. Even the street lamps conspire against the body, a black body spotlighted in the absurdity of the irrational routine. Police receive the report of an attempted armed robbery. Even the stars grow angry with the body, sitting in the sanctity of a nice vehicle, always suspect. Two dark bodies, faceless silhouettes on the firing range, on the internet, in the newspapers, on the radio. No remorse when the alleged certainty becomes mistaken identity when gunpowder pierces the flesh for a threadbare excuse, the imagined weapon, the justification for thrusting the violated and violators into calamities unforgivable, unerasable, the suppressed thought. The violators may be unhappy a young woman's black body did not die that night. They will carry their hatred home, wrap it in a sandwich bag to preserve it for another night's meal. And the black body will press on living, knowing what it means to be the bullseye. Another Juneteenth. If not here, then where would I be? Shifting across histories I never heard. The chains rattle, never felt the lash. Thrashing ocean, sinking flesh, torn from ancient land. My body never knew the name I was separated from. I, I. I search the faces coming toward me on any street in these United States of ambiguity, half expecting to find a familiar stranger to claim me, rising from south, west, east, north. I, 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 a living ghost, walking across paved over fields, hiding in plain sight my anguish, terror, layered just below the surface of skin. A legacy passed on, unanswered. If not here, in the falsehood of America, then where, who would I be had there been no shifting across history? My body, my body never, never knew. My body knew somebody sang for me. From behind her teeth, the sound of blood's rush called me from myself into myself, a body, an earth song of love and bitterness. Someone sang for me deep in Virginia pine. Someone sang for me. A hem razored the sky vermilion, pushed the wind to shove me down a snake-filled road. Somebody sang for me, fighting for my life. Someone sang for me, pulled all my am and am not from origin's darkest beginnings. 
Someone sang for me and the melodies flowed through me, planted themselves in me. I heard a soprano rustling the leaves in my ears. Someone sang for me, rattled the question in my voice, shook loose words from my hands. The pine cones buried in Virginia woods. I've always known, I've known, I've known. Someone sang for me and the oak trees shivered agreement, sacrificed their pulp for me to write down all these songs that somebody sang for me as I will sing for her, the someone of me coming after me, coming after me, coming after me, coming after me in my mind. I exist as I have always existed. A thin line navigating between plot and slap of raindrops. It's always raining somewhere. I existed in a hand clap and percussion witness. The down, back beat it, just beat it. Rhythm of pot bottom, hollow tree drum. I exist in the car honk. Exhaust fumes, the rear view mirror, muddy gravel road gravels and sticky tar pavement, citified and backwoods at all at the same time. And I exist, I exist in the muffled sound of train car wheels, steel rumbling from place to place like the tribes of Israel and Exodus. I exist in the crushed pulp of journal pages, in the ink that stains and sustains me. I'm a ragged hem woman surviving in a crowd's solitude. I exist as I have always existed, a seed dropped in a mound of warm excrement, sprouting always, cleaning up after myself when fear moves the body. I exist in street girls, leave no trace of having been there. I exist flowing off the curb in the ammonia scented footprint on hard floor tiles in in a handprint on a painted chalky flaking walls and in the piss soaked corners of housing project elevators. I exist to escape into the pages of books. I exist, I exist, I exist in wanting to exist in placenta and milk of all women, in baby's wail and smile, I exist on the dance floor, a soul train line. I live in the grooves of 33s, 45s, and 78s. I exist in civil rights freedom songs, in the assassin's bullet, in the assassin's bullet, in the assassin's bullet, in the recoiling body, in the blood, in the bomb, in the bombed out church. I exist in saving and not saving the body. I exist in my past. I exist I exist, I exist, I exist in cultural erasure. And it's a bitch to remember the fat that dripping kind of sloppy that tastes so good when organic is too expensive. In my mind, I exist in the elevator music of tall buildings that fell when hit. I exist in 9-11 dust, in the twisted mentality of hatred reigning upon me. I exist as I have always existed, a thin line navigating between the plot and slap of raindrops wherever I've lived and died, living, leaving, leaving pieces of me continually, continually, continually sprouting in shit. Thank you. Wow, everyone give it up for Miss E.J. Antonio. Uh, beautiful and vigorous way of opening up the space. Thank you so much. Uh, and next up on the lineup, we have poet Meg Carney. She's the author of All Morning the Crows, winner of the Washington Prize for Poetry, which was published by The Word Works in April of this year. Check it out, I'll drop a link. She's also the author of An, Un Un An Unkindness of Ravens, which came out with BOA Editions in 2001, and Home by Now, which came out with Four Way Books in 2009, which was the winner of the Penn New England uh, Winship Award. Uh, she's the author of A Heroic Crown, uh, The Ice Storm, which came out with Green Linden Press just last year, and three verse novels for teens, quite prolific. Her award-winning picture book, Trooper, is illustrated by E.B. Lewis, and her poetry has been featured on Garrison Keillor's A Writer's Almanac and Ted Kuser's American Life and Poetry. She lives in New Hampshire and directs the Solstice MFA in Creative Writing program at 
uh, University of Massachusetts, or no, the, the Solstice MFA in Creative Writing program in Massachusetts, which she will tell us uh, more about momentarily. Everyone give it up for Meg Carney. Thank you so, so much, Malvika and uh, Joanne, for inviting me to read with you and, and Karen and EJ. It's it's real honor. And thanks to the whole team at Brooklyn Rail, an organization I have a lot of admiration for. Um, I'm a native New Yorker, and uh, even though I live in New Hampshire now, and um, I thought since we just passed the anniversary of September 11th that I would read some poems um, that came out of that day uh, and and everything that came after that day. Um, so I was I was glad to hear EJ bring that up in that very powerful poem that you just read EJ thank you for that um, and for your reading. So um, my apartment actually had a great view of the Twin Towers. That was my, my view from my writing desk and I could actually um, see the towers when I sat up in bed. So all of a sudden there they were, right? Um, I didn't really write about 9-11 for a few years, uh, except for this one very short uh, extended metaphor that I'll start with. This is from Home By Now, um, the book that came out in 2009. And uh, the title is about as long as the poem is. It's called September 12th, 2001, View of Downtown Manhattan from My Bedroom Window. The amputee insists her legs are still down there. She feels them burning. She knows when the smoke clears, they will be standing. After um, I moved to New Hampshire in 2005, that's really when I felt more like a New Yorker than, than ever before, um, especially when people start making fun of, you know, your accent when you come up to New England and do not mention the Yankees. I don't mention the Yankees uh, up here. Um, so this is uh, from my new book, All Morning the Crows, and uh, it's called Meadowlark. So each, each poem in All Morning the Crows has the title of a, a bird, uh, but the poems aren't really about birds. Birds are just kind of their launching point. Meadowlark. What the meadowlarks were doing back in Wyoming while he diddled in the Blue Ridge, she considered only much later. At that mountain retreat, the air was sweet with briars and thyme unfurling and so their cast lines tangled. Thoughts of meadowlarks those superhero yellow breasts marked by triangles of black came only after he didn't head back west, but instead followed her home to New York. After the lone winters, the roses dried in a bowl, roses color of wine once it's turned. Popcorn blossomed, then burned on the stove as he said, I'm your man now, quit your job. I've got dinner covered. She could feel one eyebrow rise like a flag. He and his mind still living in Thailand, 1981, where the Hmong thought him a savior. He could have been, she first supposed. It was a romantic thought, like his meadowlark's fluty morning melodies hovering above the prairie, or like the roses, which never did open. He was a Rhodes Scholar in Denham, a dentist's son, a cowboy complete with guitar, waistline beginning to thicken. 
And surely, once his father died, he was too damn grief-stricken to work, seeing as she still had hers. He and his guitar might as well head to the bar where somebody's bound to know my horses ain't hungry. While west in Wyoming, meadowlarks nests in the footprints of stallions. That's a real fact. A detail the city crowd eats up. Details like frisbees in Central Park, a fast way to make friends. It was details that lured him downtown that day the towers fell. He left her with a dead phone line, cell useless too, but she had time then for her penny whistle and of course the view. Not having a horse, he rode his bike as far as McDougal or maybe J Street. The day still sickly sunny above the cloud of humans hovering there. New ghosts don't care for voyeurs lured by tragedy. Buoyant as meadowlarks, they glided in low, made sure he breathed in a lungful. That's what she imagined from her 12th story perch. That's when his stories lost their gleam. Later, she heard him describe that day as if it happened just to him. By then, she knew things aren't always what they seem. A meadowlark isn't a lark at all, but cousin to the blackbird. A detail he'd delete from his tales of cowboy glory as he was loath to let a fact get in the way of a good story. I had a college professor uh, named George Somer who urged me to try to write poems that didn't have I in them. So at first this poem was called Poem with No I in it and then it it was such a failure, um, I ended up with this. <clears throat> it's called, George Says Stop Writing About Yourself and it's dated New York, uh, December, 2001. So I was in one of those New York apartments um, that I didn't regulate my own heat and I was on the top floor. So often I had the windows open, even in winter. And sometimes in the months that followed 9-11, I would wake up in the middle of the night if the wind was blowing north and uh, I would have an apartment full of smoke. And it smelled like nothing I had ever experienced. George says, stop writing about yourself. This one's for George, who urged, take off those shit kicker boots, leave your husband wrapped in the scroll of last night's sheets. Forget your mother sipping a, do a cigarette, a Dugan's do. Forget your other mother, your other father too, and the one you last saw in a coffin, not looking at all like himself. So much not him, you couldn't bear to be near that body. Forget your first kiss, how it sounded like peanut butter tasted like a train. Stop talking about the Alabama slammers and four blue whales or those men you drove crazy with your push him, pull him love. And don't speak of babies, about not having them or the ugly one who's so much a part of your nights, she must be real. Her mongrel face breaking into sadness. Don't talk about holding her above your head, calling her sweet girl, mama's girl, how she almost smiles. Just for George, this poem looks beyond sea monkeys and that first Louisville slugger. It opens the window to that stench. Three months now, 
of that smell, man-made, human, wafting from downtown. This poem is in the street where war does its thing. See, there's a man walking up Broadway, his shoes, suit, eyelashes, lips covered with dust that used to be a building. And I'm just gonna read one more short poem from All Morning the Crows uh, called Morning Doves. And thanks to all of you who, who came this afternoon to hear us read. Morning Doves, New York, 2001. Morning Doves, wake me. One pair resting on my 12th story sill, billing and cooing. Get up, said my mother in a dream. There is much left to weep over. Sleep is for the dead. She should know. Here in the city, the dead are the air we breathe. Bits of paper, they ride the breeze. Musical notes, they fly down the morning dove's throat. Rise again as dirge. Only music can mine such sorrow. My mother never could carry a tune. Now my doves go quiet as a hawk rides the thermals between the ghosts of Tower One and Tower Two. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Meg. Uh, everyone, give it up for Meg Carney. Um, I love this musicality, and then a theme emerges as well. Um, so we are rounding out to a very particular kind of moment in our national, our national culture, our national history. Uh, Meg, thank you so, so, so much. Uh, next up, we have poet Karen Lalonde Alanier. Uh, she's the author of eight poetry collections, eight and her latest, How We Hold On, was published by Broadstone Books in April 2021, sharing a birthday with Meg's most recent collection as well. Uh, her book of poems, Looking for Divine Transportation, which came out with The Bunny and Crocodile Press in 99, won the 2002 Towson University Prize for Literature, and her jazz opera, composed, uh, her jazz opera with composer Bill Banfield, um, which is titled Gertrude Stein Invents a Jump Early On, premiered in, in New York in a production at Uncompass New Opera Theater in 2005. Uh, Karen is currently at work on a set of three books promoting Gertrude Stein's Tender Buttons. I'm so curious about this project. Uh, three books at once. Hopefully we'll know more uh, in a moment. She promotes other people's poetry through public programming and book publication at The Word Works. Uh, give it up for literary and cultural producer doing the good work, Karen Lalonde Alanier. Karen, take it away. Thank you so much. And thank you to uh, Joanne McFarlane and in general, the, the whole rail team. It's very exciting to be reading here and participating in the 52nd Radical Poetry Reading. I don't think I've ever had a, such an opportunity. Um, so in the five poems I will present today, the operative word is kitchen. And that entails cooking, eating food, the heart of living. Leo on seesaw for the pleasure of Gertrude Stein. Little Buddha, little Bruder, kleine Bruder, tiny brother, bitty bother, sitting baldly in the butter, in the batter, shaking philosophic digits in the kitchen for the kuchen. It's been eaten by the kitten, wearing mittens in the winter, hiding splinters in his fingers, finding spiders in the cracks of the plaster. So we laugh, twenty ha 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 ha, in metered breathing, something close to the day. He was born. 
while Leo on Seesaw needs uh, no introduction, um, because I have tested it with audiences in China where few, you know, few people speak much English. But I thought I should mention that it's part of my opera, Gertrude Stein invents a jump early on. Uh, the next three poems come from my latest book, How We Hold On, which was published by the extraordinarily wonderful Broadstone Books led by Larry Moore, who is in the audience today. You should get to know him. The second poem, Metal, is a parallel the form created by Billy Collins, which he radically tried to pass off as a medieval invention, exact repetition and word salad are hallmarks of this form. Metal. We want to discuss what happened. We want to discuss what happened? Where should the conversation start? Where should the conversation start? Should discuss where to start, what happened. We want the conversation. If 19 men menaced one woman, if 19 men menaced one woman, no black veil could protect her. No black veil could protect her? If 19 women could protect black, no one veil menaced her men. Terrorism starts in the family kitchen. Terrorism starts in the family kitchen? Who said metal detectors find knives? Who said metal detectors find knives? Family metal starts terrorism. Who in the kitchen said knives? Find detectors. Terrorism starts to veil conversation in the kitchen 19 detectors protect one family. What happened could start her metal. We discuss menaced men. If no black knives find the woman, should want? Who said where? Cox is a poem set in Jamaica in two parts that and it operates like a play. It centers around a family whose dad, Leroy, and mom, Rose, cook and sell jerk chicken and the greens called Kalaloo. Section one takes place on the West End Road of Negril, outside the resort Tensing Pen. Section two goes back and forth between a cockfight in an undisclosed location where the attendees are illegally smoking ganj, marijuana, and, um, and then uh, also at Leroy's home just off the West End Road where the police have arrived to arrest him on charges related to possession of ganj. A tragedy ensues. Cox. One, so so. One morning, two young Jamaicans lounged at Tensing Pen's gate, boombox pulsing out, ganja gun. Echo, new hairdo? My mate asked, bobbing to Barley's beat. The boy nodded with thuggish pride his hair only half groomed high into an afro, the other side flat against his head. How'd you do it, man? Stick your finger in an electric socket? His friend spit out a laugh, but Echo frowned. Today we meet Echo's sister, Simone, sitting next to her father's cold grill. Where's Leroy, your mom, Rose? Your parents grill the, the best jerk chicken, steam the tastiest callaloo. Home, down this road, she gestures to a dusty path just beyond the stand. 
Echo got shot by the police. Business is slow. My father, so so. Two. Bow. Under the breadfruit and mango trees, the men roll spliffs, light up, inhale, deeply inspect the cocks tethered by one foot to the ground. On the garden side of the West End Road, Leroy, in the shade of an aki tree, shakes ganja into his paper, licks it closed, lights up. Soon the birds are weighed to find an equal match. When the Negril Peak police arrive at the family home, they point their guns to the father, Leroy, get into the squad car. In the fight pen, the cocks fly at each other, pecking without pause at shaved necks, maybe an eye. But the son Echo says, you can't take my father, and picks up two rocks. In the stands, the men, hoping to double their bets, shout, kill him, don't give up. Further down the cliff road, rutless now and fast, the chef at Sirius Chicken cranks up his stereo. Marley, long time a ghost, wails, get up, stand up. Don't give up the fight. The relevance of mint shows the link between garden, herb garden, and kitchen. This is a love poem which stresses the importance of names. The relevance of mint. I breathe mint from his garden. Preferring rose hips and lemon verbena, my lover grows peppermint and spearmint for my tea generously. Today I snip stalks and share the aromatic feast with Jonathan and Beverly, the new parents of Johnny, born 18 days into June, anniversary of Etta's birth, the grandmother I lost during my first trip abroad. Much later, at a table detailed with red rose petals, I savored the ceremony of Moroccan mint tea, but I fell in love with mint when I carried my son. Ivan, his name is John, too, but in Russian, I called my Russian grandfather Honey because my mom's mom, Etta, summoned her husband Saul no matter his mistresses, in that sweet way. The Lord is gracious, and so it is that Johnny, Jonathan, Ivan, Hank, Hans, Ian, Jack, John, Johan, Juan, Sean, Shane, Vanya, and Zane all mean John. The Lord is gracious. I breathe mint and mix honey into the tea. I brew from the leaves my sweetheart grew in his garden. These fragrant leaves that sing, he loves me. So I let, wanna say thank you again to Brooklyn Rail and to my esteemed colleagues for the pleasure of reading with them, E.J. Antonio, Joanne McFarland, Meg uh, Kearney, and thank you especially to our audience for joining us here today. My last poem was recently published in Heron Clan Anthology, number eight. And Cooking Lesson was inspired by cooking a sub poem of Gertrude Stein's Tender Buttons. And I plan to have this particular poem in one of those three volumes that were mentioned at the beginning of this um, introduction of me. And um, I haven't announced yet this project because I was waiting until I could uh, get all the poems in. They're finally all in. And then I need to uh, get with my thought partners to make that happen. So here's cooking lesson. Alas, alas, Alice, 
At last, the eye pulls from its little leaf a seed not yet put in soil to multiply, swell, fill out, get taller. The ear heeds the call, hears the bell, shuns the stall, coached from its lazy couch. What china, this receptacle? What better meat than mollusk? A whole community in bed together, sperm wetted into water, the muscular feet, one each per shell, propelling the premises, scant regard for logic. Yours in poetry, thank you. Wow, thank you, Karen. Um, such tidy, such tidy little world buildings. I'm, I'm really enjoying that. And there's something so interesting about the way you're describing the three manuscripts in tandem, growing, coming together with your thought partners, and then the mint growing, the honey, so many names for, for John. Um, it's just it's just really fantastic. Uh, a lovely little sojourn into your mind. Um, Thank you so much for sharing those. Uh, and last but not least, we'll hear from our brave curator, the people's poet of the Brooklyn Rail, uh, Joanne McFarland. Joanne, uh, close us out, won't you? I will, thank you so much. And as often happens, it's just really astounding. We didn't discuss what poems we would read beforehand. So then it's always so fascinating to see how everything fits together in terms of the sounds and the themes. And it's really just such a delight. So thanks again to the Brooklyn Rail and also to Karen and Meg and EJ for being part of this. So um, I would like to read a selection of poems from my collection, Identifying the Body. And I would really love to say, I would love to thank Nancy White who is the president of the Word Works? <laughs> yes, for and Leslie McGrath, who has since passed away. But I would love to really honor and thank them for the work that they did with me to bring this collection to life. They were enthusiastic about it from the beginning, and I. I would not have been able to do it without them. So I want to just acknowledge the importance of the presses in supporting writers. So um, kind of, it kind of fits in with some of the themes that the other wonderful writers touched on. These three poems all deal with intimacy and how we, approach and distance ourselves from it. So the first poem has an epigraph. Loose horse in the valley, tell me who is gonna ride him? That's Sam Amadon from his song, I See a Sign. I lost my husband because of my big mouth. I used my big mouth to please another man and pleased he was for a time. My big mouth, my two black feet and my two black hands. My, oh my, it was grand. Now I'm a loose horse in the valley, a filly wild in the green, green, green. And nobody's gonna tell me what it should mean. I'm no child to be schooled. No, no, no. I won't be told what I must do, who I can suck or fuck. With furious winds whipping my golden tail, with blue sky above and nostrils flared, earth gives, gives, gives beneath my hooves. The next selection is from my poem, My Broken French. And the poem deals with those dualities within ourselves that can really never be fused. And so I'm going to read the first three parts. 
my broken French. Je ne suis ni homme ni femme. I am neither man nor woman. Ceux qui pleurent se sauvent. Those who weep save themselves. Je fais tromper les draps. I soak the sheets. Celle qui crie, she who cries out. Celui qui écoute, he who listens. Je les conjoins, I join the two. Le la, le la. Him, her, him, her. Puis, puis. Well, then. Qui peut remplir le puits? Who can fill the well? J'étais femme et puis. I was a wife and then. Je ne l'étais plus. I wasn't. La pluie ne symbolise rien. Rain means nothing. La ruine, c'est un vide. Ruin is a void. Le feu mange l'ouverture. Fire eats the opening. N'importe où elle se trouve. No matter where it is. Mon amant vivant, my living love. Je le vois comme plein. I see him as full. Je le lèche, I lick him. Je le suce, I suck him. Je l'aval, I swallow him. Il me dévore à son tour. He devours me in turn. Mes seins, my breast. Mes cuisses, my thighs. Ma sex, my sex. Il me baise comme un incendie de forêt. He fucks me like a wildfire. Je le monte comme un démon qui me bénit. I mount him like a demon who blesses me. The final poem that I will read is part of a collection about rage and shame. And I've, I thought it would be appropriate to close our radical poetry reading with this poem because we spend so much time in our culture talking about white supremacy, but I actually think that it is exactly the opposite, that there's an almost unspeakable power and magnetism to blackness that we don't want to really talk about. Each poem in this section begins with a quote about rage and shame. So this is one of those poems. Rage is most often produced from a perception of rejected love. Is my body mine or yours? Who are you? The state, my ex, my son, my friend, someone I meet online? Is the body that is sometimes mine knowable? What do I know about this body? I know it is dark. From darkest to lightest, it is almost the darkest a body can be. That dark, that black. My body has been entered for its blackness. It is capable of arousing meaning. Its darkness can cause what blackness means to others to vibrate. It can make them want to enter, make them want to touch, make them simply want some, a some mysterious even to me. I've been accused of pretending to be oblivious of my body's power, its power to incite. One cavalier stroker of my blackness suggested that I am a flirt, that my desire to use my body to gain stroking trumps my desire to stroke others. Not so. My lust to touch others has rarely been met. 
I inherited a deep reticence from my mother. My father was indiscriminate in the uses of his body. No doubt that is why he died young, taking in what he ought not, fucking, puking, shitting in the wrong places. My body learned early who to mistrust. My lack of trust has not deterred the touchers, the looks, the queries about how this all works. My body made two sons. Each time I thought I would die. As they came through me, they had zero thought for my future. Sweat poured from me and I wept at the possible loss. I do love them now. I can use my body to calm things down. I'm told so again and again. More and more, I use it that way to say grace. Thank you. Everyone give it up for the electrifying like power and magnetism and divinity of Joanne and her words. Um, Thank you so much, everyone. EJ, Mank, Karen, of course, Joanne, for bringing us all together, for opening up the space. Uh, to hear you all read, you know, is to, is to both love and fear you, to, and to be delighted in you. Um, I'm only remiss that this has been so short, uh, but hopefully we can have a part two a little down the road. Um, but thank you all so much. This has been so fantastic. Uh, as always, um, We'll share the recording of today's reading on our online archives as well as on YouTube, so it will be available in a day or two. Uh, if you should ever wish to revisit this magical space, I know I will. I'll take notes. Uh, we also do this every day at The Rail, so please join us again tomorrow when we're joined by our friends at Second Shift Studio Space of St. Paul in Minnesota, a nonprofit residency program and art space uh, for those of us, as Joanne said, uh, who one might be led to believe are on the margins, but are in fact uh, on the center. Um, so we're so excited to see uh, what's unfolding in that space. Uh, we're joined by Chris Larson, Jennifer Newsom, Tina Tavera, Chris Zolkowski, Roshan Ganu, Shen Chin, and Andrew Woolbright um, for a conversation on Second Shift Studio and all the good work happening over there. And we'll close with the poetry reading from John Lada. That will be, as always, at 1 p.m. Eastern, right here in the Zoom tomorrow. would love to see you. Other than that, thank you all so much. Um, I'll invite you to turn on your microphones if you'd like to say hello to one another or goodbye on your way out, anything else that uh, compels you. Um, but this has been truly a master class. Um, it's really, really stunning. Um, and thank you all so much. Just a beautiful way to spend a Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Joanne, thanks EJ, thanks Karen. Thanks to everyone. Thank thanks Meg, yeah. Thanks Thank Joanne Thank and, you. Thank you. Thank you. EJ and Karen, everyone for coming. Yes. <laughs> Karen, great. Thanks so much. This was great. Bye. That was really great. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to make this a weekly thing. Like, let's, <laughs> let's not call it a reading, let's call it, let's call it something else, sewing circle. Um, <laughs> lessons in in you know divine femininity things like that but it's really fantastic. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, look at that. Thank you so much. What's for lunch? <laughs> What's for <laughs> lunch? That look good. <laughs> <laughs> It's clean up there. Thank you so much. That's an awesome lunchroom. <laughs> we've been we've been transitioning hybrid into into back into office, and so this yeah. is what it'll look like. The Zoom space will be screened like a movie. Um, oh, I love that. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's our office. Um, that's some of our staff gathering together, and that's sort of the new Zoom venue. This is Fong, our wonderful publisher, yeah. who we all know and love. Well, that's much more fun to do it that way. Right, right? Mm -hmm.
Uh, Joanne, you'll have to come to the office for lunch and you know, we'll all have to come and see it from the other side. I'm close by. Hey, all right. All right, Nick was, Nick will make Thank you, happen. thank you again, Joanne. And thank, thank you everyone. Thank you. Today. Thank you everybody, take care. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you.